The Cannabis Conversation. A European perspective on the emerging legal cannabis industry. Welcome to the Cannabis Conversation with Anuj Desai, where we explore the new legal cannabis industry by speaking to the professionals that are helping to shape it. On today's show, I have Jacob and Benedict Sons, who are the co-founders of Cansativa. Cansativa is a German medical cannabis company, and the guys are on the show today to talk about regulation and how we should try and regulate medical cannabis in Europe. Welcome, guys. Thanks for having us. Great to be on the uh, podcast today and very much looking forward to uh, discussing uh, the regulations today. Great. Cool. Thanks, guys. So how are you getting on with this weird COVID world that we're now living in? Oh, yeah, it's definitely crazy times. I mean, you can uh, imagine that also COVID had some effects uh, for us in terms of like uh, home office, like uh, operation adjustments that were necessary. Yes, there are some effects, but we are very lucky in terms of our supply chain, in terms of our business. We weren't hit at all. Uh, actually, the last three or four months were more or less one of the most um, successful ones uh, in our uh, company's history. But yes, COVID is a big thing. And I think for everyone in, in its uh, personal life, uh, it has yeah um, severe and big in- uh, impact. Sure, 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 sure. Well, we'll we'll come on to talk about the the company in a second, actually. So uh, just before we do that, maybe it'd be good for you to introduce yourselves and just explain who you are and how you ended up uh, working in the cannabis industry. Yeah, um, so so it might be always a bit difficult to understand when when you have two brothers on the line, especially when there's no no video. So my name is um, Jakob. I'm um, co-founder of Kansativa, actually the younger of the two brothers. I have a background in law, I worked as an uh, attorney, um, focused more on, on corporate and uh, litigation uh, than on uh, regulatory affairs. But my background is clearly um, a legal background, and so my responsibility in, uh, for Kansativa is all the uh, regulatory stuff for the company. I'm, I'm Benedict, so as Jacob said, uh, the older um, a brother, um, I have a background in industrial engineering and management, started my professional career in strategy consulting, and I'm uh, within uh, Cansativa responsible for all commercial uh, topics and uh, business-related things. Yeah, we are in Cansativa since uh, 2017 when we founded the company, and it's very exciting times, um, especially for medical cannabis and uh, the outlook for the future. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So why don't you tell us a bit more about what Cansativa does? And also, what was the story in terms of why and how you started the business? So uh, about the founding story, um, maybe I will start and then Benedict can can add something to uh, what we're doing every day. So we founded the company back in 2017 when the regulatory framework in Germany changed. Um, As the, the listeners to this podcast might know that uh, since uh, early 2017, we have a, a clear and broad market and regulatory framework that provides for cannabis as a medical treatment. And the whole idea um, came a bit from my side. Um, I was to this time uh, working as a lawyer and I had to deliver a legal opinion uh, whether or not you can have the name cannabis in your company's name. Uh, because back in this time, the uh, commercial uh, register they had the opinion that this this might be misleading, and their argument was that there's no legal trade in cannabis. And I somehow assessed the, the framework and wrote some pages on why there is a legal market for cannabis. And then at a, a family uh, gathering, I uh, told Benedict and our father that there is such an, a, a, quite a new market, a quite interesting market, uh, which is opening uh, in the medical space. And so uh, it, it took us just a few beers to found then the company. And then we went to the, to the notary, uh, started everything, and uh, then somehow made a plan and a business plan on, on how we engage with the industry. And uh, first of all, Benedict and me, we continued uh, in our jobs 
So we, we did all the, the, the ramp up of the company part time. So Benedict worked 100% as a business consultant. Um, I had at least a, a 60, 70% engagement uh, with the law firm. And in the late afternoons and the evenings, we went to our first uh, facility, packed the, the packages that went to pharmacies, did, did all the operations on our own, even uh, did all the cleaning of the toilets and so on. So uh, it was really a, a one and a half man show. And then, uh, yeah, we, we tried to um, identify for ourselves if, if this is the industry that we want to be working in, uh, which we uh, answered with yes. And then uh, made a plan to, to raise money. And this is uh, like how the, the whole story of uh, really uh, building a big company started. And we then, in um, late 2018, had our seed investment round. Before that, uh, we funded the, the business on our own. We had a business angel that took care of the first product. So he uh, gave us a loan to, to pay the first products, the first shipments. And uh, when we then onboarded uh, our seed investor um, by beginning of 2019, uh, Benedict and me uh, went into the company um, yeah, with a full-time engagement. We built our team and uh, maybe this is uh, the right point where Benedict can, can talk a bit about uh, what we do uh, every day and, and how our team setup is. Yeah, so um, maybe as a very short overview, what uh, Kansativa does and uh, what we have in terms of also licenses. Uh, we are a GMP and GDP certified company. We run two operation sites in the middle of Germany, one in Frankfurt and uh, one very close to Frankfurt in a, a small town called uh, Merfelden-Waldorf. What we mainly do and what our focus of our business activities is, is to uh, import and distribute medical cannabis. So we have like big and very good partners from around uh, the globe. And those products are distributed to pharmacies in Germany. And we understand ourselves not only as a yeah, one product type of distributor, but we have a multi-brand portfolio. So uh, we have the big Canadian uh, firms within our portfolio. Of course, we also do the Betrocan business, but we have this unique platform. This is uh, unique for the German market. And um, this positions us at a as a one-stop shop to the pharmacists. So they don't need to, you know, call 100 uh, or uh, many different players to get their products. They just have us and we can take care of everything when it comes to uh, medical cannabis. Um, beside this import and distribution uh, business, we also engaged uh, a bit in uh, further services, market access and uh, regulatory services but our DNA is that we are a quality and process-driven one-stop shop distribution platform that is actually a leading one in Germany. Fantastic, fantastic. Yeah, I was just going to ask about what your USP is because our mutual friend, Alfredo Pascual, who's a um, recent guest, uh, he's obviously written about the fact that there's a lot of people importing um, medical cannabis into Germany how are you finding that platform side of things? Yeah, so that's, that's absolutely right. I think um, as of July, there were like 50 or 60 different uh, rather small companies that are at least uh, importing the Betrocan uh, products from the Netherlands, from the OMC. Uh, so a Dutch uh, authority that is actually responsible um, to yeah, deliver those um, products to those um, uh, importers. And yeah, what makes us different here is that Bedrocan is just one part uh, of our business. But we also, uh, as I mentioned, have the um, Canadian firms in our portfolio, which really adds a certain value to our key clients, um, the pharmacies. And uh, maybe as I use the definition importer, this could be a point where maybe Jacob could quickly differentiate what a importer um, is in the you know legal sense, and what is also the the difference in terms of licensing from those rather smaller Betrocan importers to maybe other uh, companies like ours. Yeah, so this this is totally right. Um, as Benedict said, um, it's uh, important to differentiate, and I think Alfredo 
our friend Alfredo, you mentioned him before, um, already uh, covered this this topic as well because there are so many wholesalers in Germany that actually just import the Bedrocan products and any trade um, that is within the European Union is, is actually considered a, a wholesale business. So even if the product is coming from the Netherlands or from Spain or from Portugal, this will be considered a wholesale business. If the product is, is, is already released uh, and batch certified by a manufacturer which is um, located within the European Union. If you want to import a product that comes from, from outside the European Union or if the manufacturing side is not releasing the product on uh, in their own responsibility, then uh, it is mandatory that you have a manufacturing and so-called importation license. So this is a, a fully different um, set of licenses. And what is uh, most important to understand is that a, a GMP certified manufacturer is actually a, a, a real pharmaceutical company. So as, uh, for example, Pfizer, for example, uh, you have all the uh, processes installed uh, for um, your batch certification for the manufacturing steps, even if the manufacturing itself uh, is outsourced, for example, because you have a contract manufacturing organization. So basically, if there is a, a small uh, startup company that claims to be a cannabis player in the market, actually trading Bedrocan only, um, you have to be always a, a bit prudent and, 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 and see exactly what they are doing. So there are many people that are just getting a Bedrocan allocation. They don't hold um, own infrastructure, so they are relying on an external warehouse service provider. They have to rely on an external a laboratory, they rely on external um, service providers, for example, for labeling. So our key differentiator is that uh, we are very fast and very uh, agile in what we are doing because we have own infrastructure and we are very deep into our own processes. What we think is, is most important is that we understand cannabis and, and Kansativa as a platform that connects several different stakeholders. It is not only bringing in products and selling them to pharmacies and wholesalers, but it is more about uh, thinking cannabis as a, a therapeutic uh, option to the end. Uh, because what is most important is to understand that um, the, the industry can only develop if you uh, have a, a focus on, on evidence. Uh, you have to understand better how products are working, how uh, the, the treatment uh, is working and how physicians prescribe the product, uh, you have to understand that there is, is always a discussion about cost because you have a very progressive um, system where uh, we have a, a cost reimbursement. But uh, if there's cost reimbursement, then the general public uh, will think about how expensive such therapy um, must be or, or can be. Uh, in the end, um, the patient has a key stakeholder because his experience and how uh, he experienced being treated and uh, how his therapy works will be very important uh, for the future of this industry. And another piece of the puzzle for us is that we have a um, subsidiary, which is the Kansativa Medical Devices, that is working on a um, vaporizer, uh, which uh, will be placed on the market as a medical device. So this will be a device that is, um, first of all, a, a vaporizer technically, so that is uh, uh, heating uh, cannabis flowers or vaporizing cannabis oils as well, so that uh, it can be delivered as a drug delivery system. Uh, and the first step, the second step is that this device will allow the patient to better control uh, his uh, therapy and for uh, the physician to better uh, monitor how the patient um, experiences this treatment. And this will be very valuable um, to collect some, some more data to create a better real-world evidence and to improve yeah, general treatment uh, based, based on data, which is, I think, uh, one of the, the, the blank spots right now in the, in, in the industry. Yeah, absolutely. There's a real focus on data and quite a few of my guests have been talking more about how we just accumulate that, you know, evidence. So yeah, going back to regulation and, and sort of the main topic of the show. So, I, I mean, without getting into too much detail, because I know in Germany, there's it's quite complicated and there's lots and lots of different licenses. But as an overview, you know, can you kind of give a summary of how it is currently regulated in Germany medical cannabis? Yeah. So, so, so I think first is that cannabis is regulated as a pharmaceutical product, as a medical product. 
So there is the always the interest in placing CBD drops and similar products as a food or a novel food. So I would uh, rather focus on the medical side uh, because novel food is, is a big topic uh, for itself. And I think it, it was covered in your podcast anyhow. So uh, when we focus on, on the medical part, um, we have to differentiate between two general um, areas of regulation. First one is uh, the regulation of uh, medicinal products. And the second one is the regulation of narcotic substances. So as cannabis is considered both a medical substance and a narcotic substance, both of the frameworks will apply. And as we have those two layers of regulation, you have two different um, uh, authorities or two different streams of regulation. So narcotics is uh, mainly the Federal Opium Agency, which is a, a federal agency uh, that is at the, the BFARM. Everyone talks about BFARM and the Federal Opium Agency. And narcotics regulation is First of all, about um, security. So uh, it is based on the target to have not too much narcotics uh, in the market, to yeah, limit the use of narcotics to the extent that is necessary for, for medical use. So this is more about security. Uh, you have to make sure that uh, the product are stored in a good condition, um, that they are secured in a, in a vault. Uh, you have uh, alarm systems uh, that need to be installed. The Federal Opium Agency is supervising the, the quantities that are manufactured, imported, and traded in Germany. So this is more about volumes, quantities, and the compliance with the international treaties, the, the uh, UN Single Convention, for example. So this is uh, basically, as I said, about security, first part. The second part, or the second layer, is the regulation of a medicinal or pharmaceutical product, and this is um, mainly about quality. So this is where you have to show compliance with the good manufacturing practice or a good distribution practice as a distributor. Uh, you will have to prove that you have a quality management system. And depending on what exactly you're doing, if it's only wholesale or if you're engaging in manufacturing and importation as well, uh, you will have to show uh, the right set of SOPs. Uh, you will have the right personnel and so on. So this is the quality part. As we have uh, on the narcotics part, uh, only a federal agency, this is a quite clear framework because uh, they define based on, on the uh, Narcotics Drug Act and, and some further regulation on how the system works. When we have a look on the medicinal or pharmaceutical regulation, you will have the problem that there are 16 separate states in Germany and uh, there are many different local authorities that are supervising the wholesale importation manufacture of medicinal products. So there, this, this is where we have a bit of a uh, fragmented sector where it sometimes depends on what your local authority thinks, for example, about the labeling, uh, the assessment on when a product will be considered an uh, active pharmaceutical ingredient or a medical product or a finished good. So there are many different questions uh, that are somehow fragmented. We see over the last few uh, months that we see a trend to harmonization on the local assessment as well, uh, because there are some practice groups of the regulators, they meet regularly and uh, they assess and, and try to, to build a framework that is somehow valid for all the 16 states in Germany. But we still see that, for example, the authorities in Berlin have some, some different opinions on, on some topics than uh, the, the authorities in, in Bavaria or in, in, in Hessen, for example, for us. Well, wow, that's a brilliant summary there. And, you know, to simplify is that, you know, the narcotics versus the pharmaceutical, not versus, but those two parallel streams with different priorities for each stream. That's great. Thank you. And how has the system changed or how have the regulations changed in Germany over the last six to 12 months? You mentioned in 2017 is when it kind of started really opening up. Has there been any major changes in the last sort of, you know, recent period? Yeah, I, I think we can observe that, especially the local authorities, when it comes to the pharmaceutical regulation, they build up some know-how and experience. So when we started back in 2017 with our first site, cannabis was totally new to the regulators. So when, when you had some, some questions about um, certain topics, no one knew exactly what to do. And this, this was um, both uh, comfortable because you were able to somehow co-create the benchmarks and the systems because you, you had a direct wire to the regulators, you could discuss and uh, everyone was open for good ideas and for uh, how to approach uh, questions. 
But uh, on the other side, there were some people that were just somehow blocking because they um, they didn't see that cannabis is something they will have to um, take care of uh, in their uh, regulatory departments. And this summer was 50-50 open doors and closed doors. Uh, what we can observe over the, the last year, I think, is that the authorities, the regulators, they, they built more know-how on, um, for example, what is the difference between a, a, um, a dried flower that is already um, uh, trimmed and dried and where, where do we uh, differentiate uh, between a raw material and a starting material in the process? When do you apply a GACP? When do you apply GMP for API? When do you apply GMP for the finished product? So there, there is some expertise that has been built, which is, I think, good for the industry because um, there are some, some criteria that are working. The benchmarks, I think, are now higher than they were um, a few years ago or even 12 months ago. And we see that there is some kind of harmonization uh, between the different local authorities. So there's, I think there was, for example, a competitive advantage uh, 12 months ago uh, when you were um, in, in uh, a, a certain location in Germany, Germany uh, compared to, for example, Brandenburg or Schleswig-Holstein. We see that, that there is harmonization. They are taking a closer, closer view on, on the processes and the systems. Um, you have uh, regular um, uh, re re-inspections of your facilities every three years. So this now is starting for the really early movers that they have their, their second inspections. So they, they really build uh, good expertise. There is a, for example, for the Bedrocan products, um, a stronger focus on uh, irradiation. Uh, there was the big case uh, for Aurora uh, as well that um, they, they didn't think enough uh, about irradiation. Um, I think there, there are some good legal questions whether or not irradiation is, is mandatory or not, uh, but this is, uh, I think, uh, way, way too detailed for, for this uh, conversation today. But uh, we see that, that there are some developments that, that lead to a, a clearer framework in the end. Yeah, and, and maybe just one or two remarks on further regulation topics is that there was some also adjustment uh, of the price uh, regulations uh, beginning of this year in March, April in Germany for medical cannabis flowers. So as uh, you may know, the uh, insurance companies in Germany, they would cover the cost for medical cannabis. Uh, and as the overall market is actually a growing market, it became more and more on uh, the, 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 the radar for those uh, companies. And at the end, it resulted also in a um, price cap for medical cannabis that is reimbursable. And uh, this is at the moment 9 euros 52 uh, per gram. And uh, if you have a yeah, outlook into the future, there could be you know further additional price regulations, maybe in the next year, maybe in the year. Um, afterwards, uh, and this is also important, that the market yeah, gets a bit more sophisticated, more educated, and is not in the early, early stage anymore, uh, so that also in terms of pricing, it is moving towards a more efficient market. Yeah, yeah, lots, lots to come, but it sounds like there's been, I mean, that learning process is really important, isn't it? I think you said with the regulators, it's very new to them. And, you know, we, we similar thing in the UK with the Food Standards Agency and various similar agencies in Europe, they're all learning at the same time as well. Okay, so I guess, you know, that's a great summary on where Germany is. Maybe you could start to talk about, you know, what are the good bits and what are the bad bits? And how do you think, how do you think this system should be regulated, I guess? I think um, what is good, working well is that, at least for Germany, the lawmaker and the regulators decided to implement cannabis in the regular framework of medicinal products. So there is a clear system. This is a systematic approach. There are some frictions, but in the end, um, it, it works to, to place the product in the medical niche and the, the medical corner. So um, first of all, this, this seems to be working quite well. I think what, what is not working, um, there are some, some general uh, issues that are, that are um, open because There's no clear understanding on how to, cl to classify the product. There's uh, no uh, standard authorization. So um, the, the, the cannabis flowers and extracts as well uh, will be used as a compounding material in the pharmacy. 
there could be different ways to regulate the product. There could be uh, there are means for for B Farm as well and for the lawmaker to somehow implement a, a standard authorization. So this this could be an option to to go for further clearer standardization and harmonization of uh, how a cannabis flower or an extract should look like. There are monographs, but uh, in the end, you could define indication fields and so on. So you you could use some evidence that that uh, already um, is existing to to somehow have a, a, a better uh, framework and a clear authorization for the products. What is not working uh, that good is that we, from time to time, fa- face problems regarding imports because um, there is always uh, some troubles with the assessment of the um, annual quotas. So um, you might know the system that um, the, the, the state of Germany has to report to the INCB in Vienna the, the quantities that Germany needs um, for, for every and, and, and any narcotic substance, for cannabis as well. And at least uh, over the last three years, we always, in like July, August, September, face the issue that uh, they have to reassess and recalculate and re-estimate the annual quotas so that um, until this reassessment uh, has been made, there won't be imports and uh, this somehow uh, can dry out the market. This is, I think, basic uh, governmental work. This is things where authorities are not that good in reacting quickly and fast. So this is, I think, something that, that might not change in the future. But um, as it happens every year, you, you, you could uh, be better prepared. I think uh, what is working as well in Germany, and I think where we are a good precedent, is the, the cost coverage. And so now we have a good working system on the assessment of whether or not the patient is eligible for cost reimbursement. This opens uh, the, the therapeutic uh, option for uh, many people because uh, cannabis is quite expensive. So uh, I think on, on the price uh, part, uh, as Benedict said, we have price regulation. Is it working? Is it, is it not working from a business perspective uh, would be better if there's no price regulation and free and liberal price building mechanisms based on uh, demand and supply from a uh, perspective that is more based on the, the, the public assessment and yeah, how the therapy uh, is used. Uh, price regulation makes sense because it is uh, less expensive for the public and you will get more patients into the uh, cost coverage if um, the therapy is not that expensive for the um, health insurance companies. So this is this is a bit uh, what I came along initially what what is working and what is what is not working. Maybe Benedict has some additional thoughts. From the regulatory uh, perspective, actually, uh, nothing to add. Cool, and, and that's great. Thank you. But if you if you could make the law, if you could choose, what are the things that you would like to see? I would like to see less regulation in terms of the overall um, regulation of narcotic substances, maybe uh, even uh, descheduling cannabis so that you would have a bit of a a free trade, uh, not all the issues about the quotas and all the reporting and assessment and reassessment. I would love to see the option to cultivate anywhere where you want. So um, this is always an issue do we need state-controlled domestic cultivation? I think uh, it should be left to the markets to decide where is the best location to cultivate a, a plant. And I think there are many areas in the in the world that could be more suitable than Germany. Uh, but I think um, having a more liberal market would be easier to somehow have the best product and the highest potential in terms of uh, cost savings and quality to the people instead of um, having clear and, and strong system where you have uh, at least for a few a few years always uh, state control and only uh, a few uh, cultivators, uh, importers, distributors. So less state control might improve quality and innovation. However, I would always stick to the system that uh, medical regulation uh, that applies to uh, different products should be applied to cannabis as well um, as it is used as a pharmaceutical product. And um, that's why I would Love to see the lawmaker grant a uh, what what we would call a, a standard zulassung, a, a standard or generic authorization, where um, the the lawmaker uh, engages a bit more in uh, assessment of the evidence that already has been created uh, about the evidence that is created alongside with the treatment since 2017, because the the physicians are obligated to report 
several indicators and in, in, in how they uh, treat people with uh, cannabis. And uh, I would, if, if I was the lawmaker, I would uh, try to create some incentives to uh, have a bit, a bigger focus on, on creating evidence uh, and research on the topic, because it is a, a, a area um, where it is very hard to commercialize R&D, uh, because it is hard to get some IP protection on the product. So you would need um, either a protected genetic, you would need a protectable a manufacturing process or anything else, uh, but it's very hard because it is a plant-based medicine uh, to, to have a positive business case if you spend a lot of money uh, on R&D. And I think this is crucial uh, to have a long-term option and a long-term uh, vision for cannabis as a medicine uh, to engage with R&D and create more evidence. This, this would be something that, that I would uh, try to, to incentivize companies for if I, were, if I was the lawmaker. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good summary there. And I think, as you say, you know, the pharmaceutical side of things and ensuring and maintaining standards is very important because if you want cannabis to be considered as a medicine, it needs to be, you know, ranked alongside how we deal with medicines generally. But it seems like the narcotic side of things is a is a bit of a millstone, let's say, where it's just causing unnecessary roadblocks and bureaucracy. Yeah, exactly. So uh, if we could treat cannabis as a non-narcotic substance and, and could deschedule it, it, it would make th many things easier because you would be quite liberal in, in where you cultivate the products uh, and uh, the lead times were not uh, that long because all those pre-assessments of compliance with the uh, convention and so on uh, could be skipped. However, I think this is the general question of how we treat cannabis in a society. If we consider cannabis as a psychotropic and, and drug substance, or if we see uh, that uh, it has a medicinal uh, potential that, that we could explore better if we were not too much uh, tied by the, the narcotic regulations. Yeah, and it sounds like it's a, you know, it's a function of just many decades of stigma and misinformation, really, saying it was you know, purely harmful or had no medicinal value and now that's starting to change but obviously that's going to take some time particularly as you say with public authorities are quite slow to to change so hopefully it happens more at a, at a quicker pace are there any other jurisdictions that you look at and you think okay they're doing these things right you know israel north america these sort of guys anything from those other areas that you think is working so i think in terms of how we regulate cannabis, I would identify Germany as, as, as leading in this field and as benchmark. In, in the beginning, when we first engaged with the industry, uh, I, I couldn't really understand why the German regulators uh, came to the conclusion to treat cannabis flowers, not as an um, active pharmaceutical ingredient, but as a, uh, a final product, which makes many things more complicated than having uh, the, the classification as an API. So in, uh, I think most of the, the other jurisdictions, cannabis flowers are, are classified as an API. I think in the end, uh, it, it makes things more complicated, but safer as well. And um, I, I now can understand that if you use the, the flower itself to treat a patient because they will be vaporized and not uh, somehow compounded into an extract or a, a, a different preparation, it makes sense to, to, to be more uh, strict uh, on the regulations. I think there are many uh, jurisdictions that have a better engagement with this new building industry. So they, they would be focusing a bit more on um, how to incentivize companies, uh, how to uh, give a or create a startup ecosystem in the cannabis industry. But I think the main reason is that compared to other medicinal industries, cannabis is just a, a small market for Germany. And there, there are many other countries in, in, in the world they, they, that see cannabis as uh, a big chance to engage with the global markets. So this is uh, something that yeah they could, would be would be nice uh, if we have a, a a bit better collaboration between uh, the general public, the politics, and and the cannabis industry in Germany. Uh, however, I think there are good reasons uh, for um, why in, in other jurisdictions there is a closer and, and better incentivization of yeah start startup companies focusing in this area. I think what is always important is that we have an uh, open discussion 
on how we see the future of cannabis. So uh, if we want to leave it in the, the medical area where we as a, a pharmaceutical company see the product or um, if there are uh, ways and options um, to at least uh, for parts of the plants like CBD uh, in a um, non-regulated food or novel food market. So I think uh, this is could be something where other jurisdictions are more focusing on how to build industries and how to uh, create values instead of just yeah applying rules and, and regulations and see yeah have have decisions based on frameworks instead of discussing how we can change frameworks to maybe create industries and create value for countries and, and for yeah companies that are on the rise. So yeah, great, thank you. I'm just conscious of time, so. Maybe Benedict, you might want to take this uh, the final question, the obvious question: How will COVID affect <laughs> the industry? And what what are you sort of seeing from your recent experiences? But what are you seeing in terms of the future as well? Yeah, so I think that's probably one of the most important questions uh, at the moment. I mean, we as society, as global industry, we are um, faced uh, to a let's say unsecure future. No one knows uh, about uh, how the pandemic uh, will develop over the next year. We're all waiting uh, for uh, vaccinations uh, and so on and really hope that we get a solution here to the COVID pandemic. I mean, until then, we all need to live with the situation and uh, maybe one or two examples from our company and then maybe uh, also talking about the overall sector relating uh, to COVID. COVID. I mean, obviously, we have uh, pandemic emergency plans uh, in place. So we have, you know, home office rules, we have split team uh, rules, uh, and so on. Uh, we are monitoring very closely our supply chains, uh, you know, put some extra buffer stock in our warehouse so that you're always well prepared in terms of, you know, borders get closed again, supply chains maybe not working anymore. Um, so far, uh, we are, as I said uh, at the beginning, uh, we're very lucky that everything worked out pretty well. But um, for the overall industry, I think it's a very critical moment because the one thing is this global pandemic. The other thing is that, I mean, since end of last year, the whole cannabis industry is more or less in a yeah, crisis in terms of cash in terms of funding and so on. And if a global economic crisis, even a recession comes together with a industry crisis, I truly believe that there will be a lot of consolidation uh, just around the corner. Maybe even big firms might uh, fail over the next uh, month. And this is obviously something what we're also monitoring very close because uh, we want to, uh, you know, give German patients and European patients access to medical cannabis. And for that, we need strong partners um, that uh, have a sustainable business model. And in this environment that we have at the moment, I think there are a lot of question marks and concerns that you might have and that uh, you need to solve uh, rather fast uh, than late. Yeah. Yeah. Consolidation is something that a few people have talked about and, I'm sure there's lots of conversations going on in behind the scenes with lots of big companies involved. So uh, watch this space. But I mean, hopefully everyone's having to think about health and doing things differently. And I think the environmental and sustainability kind of aspects of things are also being looked at. So hopefully that presents a positive case for cannabis going forward. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Healthcare industry is crucial and also medical cannabis has a crucial role for a lot of pain suffering patients uh, around the globe. And um, I mean, if there is a, a pandemic, a COVID pandemic, there are still yeah, patients that uh, desperately need the medication. And that's also a very important task to all of those that are engaged in the medical cannabis industry to really serve uh, these patients' needs. So totally agree. Yeah, yeah. Well, fingers crossed for a positive future <laughs> uh, in every respect. <laughs> Guys, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been really good to talk to you and get a really good idea of 
uh, what's going on in Germany and actually, you know, it makes a lot of sense to sort of use Germany as the model because not only is it, you know, by far the biggest market in Europe, but as you say, you've had the chance to develop the regulations over there and there's still a lot of work to do, but but yeah, good to see how things are progressing. So uh, thank you for joining and, and helping us understand that a bit more. Yeah, thank you very much. It was a great uh, talking to you and a great discussion. Cool. Thanks, guys. Take care. Thanks for joining me for that. Hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy it, please hit subscribe on whichever podcast platform you use. I'd also love a nice five-star review on iTunes if you have the time. You can also follow the Cannabis Conversation page on LinkedIn and also sign up to my mailing list via cannabis-conversation.com. Until next week, have a good one.